Hi, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my class on Programming in Go. In this section, I'm going to drill down into channels a bit. I want to talk about buffered versus unbuffered channels and get into the difference between channels as a communications tool and channels how they synchronize parts of your program. With that, I'm going to give you a very useful uh, diagram about channel states and then I'm going to talk about how channels can be used to make a particularly useful structure called a counting semaphore. Okay, so these first couple slides are going to be a little bit of review. I have talked about channel state already a bit in terms of, you know, blocking and not blocking, right? A channel blocks when you try to send if there's nobody ready to receive. Well, that's if it's unbuffered. And if it's buffered, it blocks because there's no space. Now, on the receive side, it's a little different, right? Obviously, it blocks if there's nothing to read, but you can read from a channel that is closed. And we'll talk about closed channels in just a sec. I've also talked about how channels are unidirectional, and I like that term. There's a couple people running around saying channels are bidirectional. I don't like that because that implies they're full duplex, right? And full duplex means you can send and receive on both ends, sort of like talking in a telephone. We can both try to talk over each other while listening and effectively. But a channel really has a read end and a write end. Now, what we can do when we pass a channel into a function is we can constrain it by only giving the read end or the write end. And that's useful in terms of information hiding. If I know I'm going to pass a channel to a Go routine that only needs to write it, then I can give it just the write end, and that eliminates certain kinds of problems that could occur in my program, right? It just simplifies things. But a channel is still unidirectional. Everything goes from one end to the other. So closed channels, well, let me step back. Channels are a bit like maps, right? When we went to a map, if it was empty, we could still read it. What we got was a default value. And a map had a two-value read that said, hey, the second value is a Boolean that tells us, was that value actually there, or is it the default value we get from reading empty? So a channel is like that. I can read a channel, and if it's closed, I get the default value. And if I use the two operation read, well, then I get the second value tells me, is the channel actually open or is it closed and I'm getting default values from reading a closed channel? You may ask, why is it useful to read a closed channel? And let's put that off for just a sec. Let me jump into the playground because I want to demonstrate this program. It's trivial, okay? I'm going to run it and it's going to produce the output you expect. And the reason I'm bringing it up though is because I can show something else in here, okay? So I get true if the channel was open, and when I close it, I get the zero value because it's a channel event, and I get false. The reason I really brought this up here is I want to go back to this notion of unbuffered channels and ask the question, what happens if I run this program? It has no buffer. Now, you should figure it out by now. It's going to block, but actually it's going to do something else. Okay, It's going to crash. And the reason it's crashing is that Go has in its runtime a built-in deadlock detector. Right. Now, what's deadlock? Well, that's the case where none of your Go routines can make any progress because they're all waiting for something. Here, I just have really the one Go routine. It's waiting for a channel that will never become ready. And so the program can't make progress. Now, deadlock is sort of a secondary effect. In a concurrent program, the first thing we worried about was a race condition. And so we use tools for synchronization, like channels and other things, to prevent race conditions. But those can cause problems themselves. And deadlock is the most common problem we get from trying to solve race conditions. We lock our program up so safely that it doesn't actually do anything. Okay. Anyway, Go has a built-in deadlock detector. I wanted to show that. When it can figure out that no Go routine can be scheduled, it will crash your program and tell you. And that's very useful. Now, let me go back to the slides because I want to talk about closed channels again. Okay. Why is it useful to close a channel? Well, that's a tool for signaling. And so I talked about this before, right? One of our problems with Go routines, in fact, the most common problem, is we need to make sure they end. And it's possible to leak a Go routine. We saw that in the last segment. I showed you for about 10 minutes the most common way to leak a Go routine. So we want to make sure Go routines end. And a useful way to do that is to have some sort of channel that signals, hey, we're done, stop. And one way to do that is actually just to close the channel. If I have a channel that's never been written to, any read will block. As soon as I close it, it becomes readable with the default value. So just closing a channel itself becomes a signal. The channel becomes ready to read, 
And if we have it, for example, in a select block, then it's possible it'll get selected. Great. We still have the issue of who gets to close the channel. That is a little more difficult. And I'm just teeing this up here. The next segment, we're going to talk about several ways to structure a concurrent program and manage the work. And I'm going to actually get into how do we do that. But I just want to go ahead and tee it up now about closed channels. There's another possibility, and that is a nil channel. Okay, what is the state of a channel variable if I don't actually put a made channel into it? And the answer is it's nil. That's the default value of a channel variable. So what can I do with a nil channel? And the answer is, well, nothing really. If I try to read or write a nil channel, it will block permanently because there's no possibility of anybody reading or writing to it. But, okay, and that's why I have this little clever asterisk right here, okay, but if I put a nil channel in select, it gets ignored. And that's a very powerful tool, right? I can nil out a channel that's in a select, and suddenly it just becomes not part of the select anymore. Now, one way of using that is to actually enable or disable a channel temporarily. I can suspend a channel so I don't read from it, and then put the channel back into the variable and read from it again. Okay, we're also getting to the realm of things that are tricky. Because at one point, I had a server where I was trying to do something clever like that, and I spent about two days chasing my tail figuring out that I had done something wrong. So let me tell you, if the main point is to signal that there's no more input, like end of file, then just close the channel. That's the simplest and safest thing to do. All right, Nilling a channel is more of a special case thing. We can do it, and it's useful, but it gets you into more complicated ways of thinking. And we'll talk a little bit about that also in a later segment when I talk about gotchas. I'm going to have a whole segment on the gotchas of concurrency and select in particular. So I want to leave you with this little reference diagram. And I think this is a very useful diagram. I haven't seen anything quite like it in anybody else's presentation or book. Okay, It summarizes the states. And we have over here, these are sort of the dynamic states of what's in the channel, how much. And over here, we have a couple of static states of whether I gave you only the receive end or only the send end. And then we have the question of, you know, what operations can I do on it? Can I receive on it? Can I send on it? Can I close on it? Certain operations are allowed. Certain operations will fail at compile time. If I give you the receive only end of a channel and you try to send, well, that won't compile. Some of the other ones will panic and your program will crash, right? So in particular, I want to point out that attempting to close a channel that's already closed will panic, which is why I said only one Go routine can close a channel. Okay, It can only be closed once. And that does mean we have this issue of, well, who gets to close it? And I'll come back to that. Now, down here, there's a couple of details in the asterisks, right? Again, a nil channel, normally it blocks reading or writing, but if I put it into a select, it gets ignored. Okay, And if I close a channel, once, it's, once I'm done reading the values that were actually there, so I think I should say that. If I have a channel and it's buffered and I put some values in it and then I close it, it's not done until the values that were read are first read out of it. And then, once there are no more real values, you'll see that it's closed and you'll start getting default values. All right? And that's just like reading a file or a socket. You get to the end of the file, right? you have to read all the data out, and then you get the end of file indication. Okay? Channels are no different. That's going to be very important when we talk about building a real program. Okay, so now I want to flip this into a slightly different conversation. Right? We've talked about channels buffered or unbuffered. I want to talk about how they behave in detail. It's a little bit complicated, but I think it's worth the discussion. And I'm going to have an illustration also. I'm going to build a little program to try to show how this really works out. Okay? If I have an unbuffered channel, which is the default, right? if I don't make a buffer for it, it will be unbuffered, then our model of communication, the term I want to use is rendezvous. Now, rendezvous is an old term from the 70s, and it really came out in the development of a programming language called ADA. Right? ADA also has some elements of CSP. It's not a term usually used with Go, but I think it's a good term, because what it suggests is meeting. And I want to give you this analogy of delivering packages. Right? Let's suppose you have a package that requires a signature. So the driver drives up, comes up to your door, rings a doorbell, and waits for you to come to the door and sign for the package. 
and then you both go your ways, right? And a buffered channel is more like a mailbox. Somebody drives up, shoves letters in your mailbox, you come and get them later, okay? So the rendezvous model is what you get with an unbuffered channel, and it's a synchronization point, okay? The sender and receiver are going to come together, and literally they're sort of like going to come together, do something to exchange data, and separate, okay? That's why it's called a rendezvous. Whoever comes first has to wait for the other one. So let's suppose on the left-hand side of this diagram, I have a sender. The sender is trying to send on this channel, so that's this operation right here. Okay? Nobody's ready to receive, and so it blocks, and the red part here is the blocking. Okay? So the sender is blocked through that red section. Okay? A receiver eventually comes along, okay, and a receiver starts to receive from the channel, and then gets some data back, which is the second arrow. And what's very important is the last arrow is the sender returning from doing the send. Okay? The sender doesn't return until the receiver has finished receiving. Now, there's at least one person who said something like, well, the send happens after the receive. And that's nonsense. Okay? You can't receive something that hasn't been sent. But what does happen is the sender starts to send, the receiver starts to receive and finishes, and then the send finishes. Now, why is that important? Okay. The receiver, obviously, if it's receiving a value, knows the value's been sent. Can't get something that wasn't sent. What about the sender? Well, because the model works this way, the sender knows when the send is done that the receiver has received. It's happened. It's already happened. And so we have a two-way synchronization point. The sender and the receiver come together and split up, knowing that the sender is sent and the receiver has received. Now, this is very different from the buffered model, because in the buffered model, you throw something in the letterbox and you have no idea if anybody came and got it or not. Okay? So this is the channel as a synchronization tool. Okay? It's very powerful in that. Now, on the right-hand side, we have the same thing, but the receiver comes first. The receiver comes blocks, the sender starts to send. Notice the receiver gets a value first and returns, and then again, even though the receiver started first, the sender ends last in both of these cases. The receiver always returns and then the sender returns. So the sender knows that the receive has happened. Let me go to the buffered case. Okay, the buffered case is a little different. Because, and I'm assuming, for the purpose of this diagram, the buffer is neither empty nor full. Okay? We have a buffer that has capacity, it has something to read and some space to write into. And so, for example, the sender just goes ahead and does its operation. It puts a data into the channel, returns. Eventually, the receiver comes along and receives some data. Now, the receiver may not receive the same piece of data. Okay? Let's suppose there's already two pieces of data in the channel. The sender sends a third one. The receiver is going to come and receive the first one because they come out in the order they went in. That part we're sure of. Okay? That's also why we think of it as a one-way channel because things go in one order and they come out in that order. Right? And it happens the same way either left or right in this picture. The receiver can come and read first and then the sender can add something to the buffer later. And again, for the purpose of the picture, we're assuming the buffer is neither empty nor full. If the buffer is empty, the receiver blocks until there's something there. If the buffer is full, the sender blocks until there's space. But normally, the process of sending and receiving, they're disconnected. They can happen at sort of at different times, right? Somebody comes in and sends, somebody later comes in and receives, and what's important then is the sender does not know that the receiver has actually received, okay? Again, the receiver already, always knows that something was sent because you can't receive something that wasn't sent but the sender doesn't know that the receiver received. Okay, well that's acceptable in some cases. What's the difference? If I think of the channel as primarily a communications tool, then I don't really care about the synchronization. It's thread safe or it's go routine safe because it has synchronization, but I'm really just concerned about I'm shoving values into it and you're reading values out of it. We can also look, though, at this, the channel as a synchronizer that says, hey, yes, we really did meet up, and I know that you got it. I know that I've handed it off to you, and you've now got that piece of data and are processing it. And that's also useful in doing certain kinds of program structure operations. 
Now, the, what's on this next slide is not terribly exciting because I just showed this to you in the playground. Okay, I have a buffer channel, and because of that, I can write twice into it without blocking and then turn around and read from it. Okay, this program wouldn't work without a buffer of at least two. If I reduce the buffer to one or zero, then one of these sends is just going to fail. Okay, because there's no other reader. Right, we just saw that. This, ch this slide is a little bit redundant because of what I showed in the playground. But I want to go back to the playground with a different program. Now, this program is going to be defective in one sense, and I'll explain that in a second. But I'm doing it because I want to show the difference in rendezvous behavior versus regular buffering behavior. So I've got a program, all right? And I've got a little structure, and I made it deliberately very small. It's got a byte and a bool, so it probably takes up two bytes, okay? It's small enough because I... For the purpose of this program, I'm going to do something sort of race condition-ish. That's not even an adjective. But I'm going to sort of create a race condition, which I want to minimize by being able to copy something very, very quickly before anything else can happen. So I've made this structure deliberately small. Okay? And we're going to have a send function. My send function is going to take a channel. It's going to create an object of type T, take its pointer, and put the pointer into the channel. Okay, so I'm not sending along the value, I'm sending along the address of a value that I'm responsible for. Okay. After I send it, I'm going to modify it. And this is the dangerous part. Okay. This is deliberately a race condition. You never want to do this in a real program. Okay. Once you hand something into a channel, you've given up ownership of it. Don't mess with it anymore, because if you're messing with it, then you're probably going to mess it up. I'm doing that again because I want to prove a point. So in my main program, I'm going to make a slice, and I'm going to make it with capacity, so I can write some stuff into it immediately without having to do an append, because if I do an append, I'm going to have to wait for memory to be allocated, and I don't want to do that. And I'm going to create a channel. It's an unbuffered channel, so I'm going to have rendezvous behavior. Okay? I'm going to start five Go routines who are going to send me data. I'm going to sleep for a second, which that means all the Go routines are guaranteed to have started. And then I have a little loop. And what I'm doing in my loop is I'm reading the channel which has a pointer, immediately dereferencing the pointer and copying it. Now, I could try to print the value at the same time, but again, printing takes time. I've got to go and do I.O., and I don't want to do that. So I want to read and copy as fast as I can, all right, and then I'll print it afterwards. And the reason I'm doing that, again, is go back to this. I'm creating a race condition. The sender is going to modify the value through the pointer after sending it. And so I want to minimize any time delay between that operation and actually making a copy. Because once I copy it down here on line 32, it's frozen. Right? And any change that happens after that won't be visible to the main program when I go to print it. So what happens when I run the program? Okay. Now, the, the order of numbers down here is random because I've got these go routines and they run at random. Notice the values are all false. Okay, why is that? In my send function, I'm doing a blocking send, and I'm doing a rendezvous. So I created my T object, and I'm sending it. Okay, but what I said before was, the receive finishes before the send finishes. So down here in my main program, I think I can just get those two on the screen, my main program receives and copies, probably before the sender has a chance to return from its send, and then modify the actual value. So I'm copying it while it's being sent, right, with the false value. And when this line here, 17, puts true into there, it's too late, because I've already copied the value into my slice in the main program, and what's being changed is a value that just doesn't matter anymore. It's a value that's about to be garbage collected. Okay, so they all come out false. Now, let me change this to have a buffered channel, and I'm going to make it a buffer of space 5, because I have 5 Go routines. Okay, let's run that program. Every single one of them is true. Why? Right? Well, now my sends are non-blocking. So, my main program sleeps for a second, which is like a million years in computer time. Right? 
So all of my sends happen. I put five values in the buffer. Now, but those are pointers. And I still have a pointer in send to the thing that's being pointed at, which I modify. And afterwards, these go routines are all done. They've all closed up shop. They've left their values in the buffer, which are the pointers. And they've modified the actual data through the pointer. So now when I go down here and read the channel, I'm reading values that have already been modified. Okay. Now, why did I do this? I did it so I can prove a point about rendezvous, right? The sender sends, the receiver receives, and finishes receiving, and then the sender finishes sending. Okay. Now, I showed that by doing something very dangerous. Again, I created a deliberate race condition. So if you're familiar with car commercials, they have a little fine print at the bottom, professional driver on a closed track, don't do this at home in your neighborhood. Okay. Don't ever do this in a real program because I've created a data race that will corrupt the data in a real program. I only did it to prove this point. But I wanted to show you visually the difference between rendezvous behavior and buffered behavior. Okay, so now the question would be, well, why buffer? All right, so there's two reasons. We've seen one already, right? In the last segment, we had a Go routine leak, and the way we solved the Go routine leak was by buffering the channel. So the Go routines whose values we didn't care about still had a place to write their values and go away. Okay, so we buffered in that case because of correctness. Our program would leak Go routines if we didn't. The other reason is a little more subtle. If we think as a Go routine as a channel for communication, if we do rendezvous behavior, there's a bit of delay, there's blocking. Let's suppose I have a channel that one Go routine is reading from, and I have a dozen Go routines that want to write into it. Well, they can only write one at a time, and they can only write when the receiver is ready to receive, and so we've added a bit of friction, a bit of delay. And if our primary purpose is not synchronization, it's just to get the data through, then buffering the channel can actually improve performance a bit. And we're going to see that in the next segment, again, when I talk about building a practical program. Okay. I want to make the point, though, and I think this is a very important point, that if we're looking at buffering from a performance standpoint, we should delay doing it, right? Right? Premature optimization and all that stuff because buffering sometimes will make it harder to see race conditions, right? So if you're just using the channel as a communications tool, leave it unbuffered, get your program to work correctly, and then when you go to tune performance, add a bit of buffering where it's needed to make the program run just a bit faster. Now, how much? Well, you don't know. You have to experiment, all right? It's going to depend on your workload, and it's going to depend on the hardware you're running on as to how much buffering can actually help but it will help some, and we'll see that, again, in practical examples. There is a special case, though, that I want to pull out, and I'm going to bring it up on this slide, and in the next segment, we're going to build this and try it. Okay? There is a particular pattern in which we use a buffered channel as something called a counting semaphore. I want to go on full camera for a second, not talking head, so I can wave my hands and you can see them. All right? I want to give you an analogy. We're living through this pandemic, and so one of the things we've got to worry about is too many people in a store, right? So what do you do? Well, you put somebody out front of the store with a little clicker, and they count off the number of people coming in the store. And when the store has reached its capacity, then nobody else comes in. You all have to line up in front of the store, right, at your six-foot intervals. And as one person leaves the store, somebody else is allowed to come in. Another person leaves, another person comes in. And if we don't have a line out front, then each time somebody leaves, we click the clicker down until we get to zero, right? And so the clicker is keeping track of how many people are inside, and when it gets to some limit, we don't let anybody else in. And that's what a counting semaphore does. A counting semaphore is a programmatic tool to limit work in progress or occupancy. Okay? And the way we do that in Go is we model it with a buffered channel. A buffered channel has a fixed number of slots. If they're all used up, nobody else can send. And in order to let somebody else in, we read. We read to open up a space in the buffer, and that means somebody else who wants to send can. <clears throat> and so we use the process of sending as the gatekeeper. If you can send on this channel, there's space for you to go in and do your work. When you're done, of course, you take something out. And if there's no space on the channel, then your attempt to send blocks until somebody else leaves. Okay? And that gives us a way to say, hey, there's a maximum number of workers that can work at one time. It doesn't limit the total number of workers. There could be a bunch lined up outside. It limits how many are active. And again, 
I'm not going to drill down to it right now. That's the topic of the next section or part of it. We're going to get into some pro practical programming and we're going to see counting semaphores in action. Okay, so that's my little drill down into some details about channels. I wanted to get into the buffering versus unbuffered behavior and talk about what rendezvous is and demonstrate it. And then why do we buffer? And then I wanted to pull out this particular example of the counting semaphore just so you see it before we see it in the next program as we get into my more complicated example of practical concurrent programming.